Good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation in this last week of 2016 to come all the way to this part of Singapore. Yeah. Many of my friends say that if they make the wrong turn, they go into Malaysia. There was one time one of the Vietnamese embassy guy actually called me near the, course, near the second link to say, where is the university? Does he have to cross across the bridge? Yeah. We are here to launch this book called Forward Engagement, RSIS as a think tank of international study and security in the Asia Pacific. This book commemorates the 20th anniversary of our school. It was originated, founded in 2016, at that time, it was called the Institute of Defense and Security Studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at that time, uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh uh, was very instrumental, helping our late President S. R. Nathan to establish the school on a firm footing. He had just corrected me. It's called IESS Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies. Yeah. This book contains various uh, essays written by different uh, colleagues who have spent time here in the school, as well as some younger scholars and researchers. We put them together into a book, small book. Uh, Afterward, you will see it when Minister launched it. But we thought it's quite meaningful to uh, put together all these ideas and thinking of our various uh, researcher, scholars, and even our uh, administrative staff, some of them make some um, small uh, sound bites as a way of expressing their uh, interest in the school, being part of the RSIS family. But the takeaway from all these writing and essays is really a strong commitment to a forward-looking vision, which basically embody what RSIS is today. Today, the school has five big centers. One is the original IDSS. Second, the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research. Third, the Center of Excellence for National Security. Fourth, the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies. And last but not least, the Center for Multilateralism Studies. We also have two important programs. One, the SRP, which stands for Studies in Interreligious Relations in Plural Societies, SRP, and the small but uh, growing in importance uh, program called the Science, Technology and Security uh, Program. Basically, this particular STSP covers science, technological development, and all those having impact on the other five centers as well as the SRP. So over the years, we developed the expertise in these centers and these programs and systematically look at how we can get better value out of all the work that we are doing. Actually, the establishment of RSIS from the original IDSS is, is in itself a forward engagement because at that point in time, the people who originated this idea of IDSS saw the need for us to develop a systematic way of analyzing, studying regional development, global development, and how it impacts on our countries as well as uh, all the uh, issues of interest to Singapore. Over the years, the strength of RSIS has been our ability to produce research and provide an education that is both scholarly and relevant to the pressing real world and current challenges such as today's climate change, homeland security, terrorism and extremism, even food security, and most recently, cyber security. So RSIS is now a center for education. First, we hope we can bring people from the policy making side, the regional elites, to come together with Singaporeans to look at some of these policy issues and help to build up a good network 
under which many of these individuals who are policy makers can cooperate with one another, build confidence among themselves, and to contribute to tackling some of these common challenges. Secondly, education in terms of our Master of Science programs as well as PhD program, which the school offers. Hopefully, our education will enable our students to ponder the improbable, as the late Mr. Nathan always remind us. More importantly, the RSIS education provides all those who have passed through the school the foundation to engage in policy thinking and other thought development relevant to the issues of the day. Going forward, this dual track approach will continue, both policy as well as uh, education, scholarly education. But what we are looking at is how to get better, quicker analysis and send this out to the society at large. So we are looking at cutting-edge technological platform to ensure that our research meets just-in-time policy needs and uh, will be of value to all the policy makers. Today, RSIS is well known for two things. One, we have many distinguished public lectures, public seminars, uh, workshop roundtables. Basically, this enables all the interested parties to engage in conversation. Secondly, we publish our ideas and thinking in books, papers, and the popular RSIS commentary, which is edited by Yang Lazari. Yeah, he's over there. Yang and Mushai Ali. These two fellows have uh, to work 24-7, uh, 365 days. Currently, we are almost two days, four days, three days left for the work year. But you still have a few more to pull out. Yeah. And we have already put out this year 314, the latest count this morning. So people look forward to reading these commentaries. We try to keep it to 1,000 to 1,200 words and try to be uh, multifaceted. Sometimes we talk about diseases, sometimes we talk about agriculture. Once in a while we talk about very esoteric things like technological development and artificial intelligence, which I have to read twice to understand what the author uh, are trying to say. But it is useful because uh, many people look at this uh, commentary and I believe now our mailing list is about 16,000 uh, subscribers actually is free. The debate for us is whether we should charge a small sum of money, Minister. Uh, I think maybe by then we will reduce our subscriber list to 160 instead of 16,000. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, I should let the other uh, colleagues who have engaged in this uh, venture to talk more about the book, but just to say that you know, the various contributions in this volume basically reflect our fundamental philosophy of what Mr. Nathan called Ponder the Improbable, looking forward, engaging in conversation, engaging in different ways to address the issues which will affect our peace and security. And we don't believe that this peace and prosperity is an abstract proposition. It is a very serious thing that we have to understand, and especially in these days when we have so many of the stresses and uh, pressure from uh, what I call uh, non-state actors uh, engaging in various extremist ideas and activities. So in conclusion, RSIS remain a work in progress even after 20 years, we hope to continue to shape ideas, keep the peace, let people understand and appreciate the issues of international security, international uh, uh, issues more uh, comprehensively. And I look forward to working with all of you and the support of all of you is needed to uh, bring RSIS to a higher level. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Ambassador Ong. We now invite Associate Professor Alan Chong to deliver the editor's introduction. Professor Chong, please. Minister Chan, Executive Deputy Chairman, Ambassador Ong, Dean Joseph Liang, and distinguished guests. 
When I joined RSIS in 2009, I was quite puzzled by then Dean Ambassador Barry Desker's description of RSIS as, I quote, a mixed economy, unquote. From what I recall, and I do admit I'm not trained as a political economist, perhaps the next book should be edited by someone from IPE, uh, of A-level economics, a mixed economy was a shorthand for a free market that could not make up its mind about the role of government intervention. Or worse, it could be a free enterprise system failing its citizens uh, and requiring, therefore, the firm smack of government discipline to ensure that citizens did not lose out in terms of cultivating foreign investment. Subsequently, I found out uh, that Mr. Desker had in mind something more dynamic, what I would call a creative tension between self-driven and school-initiated academic research on one hand, and on the other hand, responsibilities to RSI stakeholders from government and other funders. All right? We are funded not just by the government, but also uh, various uh, other uh, philanthropic foundations and so on. One big takeaway from me from editing forward engagement is how this creative tension is frequently played out across multiple parts of the school. Uh, and here I take liberties to draw attention uh, to what comes out in some of the chapters. Now the chapters by uh, Ambassador Ong and Dean Joseph Liao are in fact quite illustrative in alluding to RSIS's dual role in balancing research and other institutional responsibilities. Uh, and I think these two chapters do set the tone at the front and at the back of the book in terms of what's coming out, in terms of this duality. And it is, in fact, a very tricky balancing act. Uh, why is this so? Academic research, for those of us who are committed academics, requires a critical distance from the object of research. This often means adopting a third position of critically and equally uh, you know, treating all parties to an issue as suspect for deep analysis. It also means adhering, all right, and this is sometimes uncomfortable for some of us too, uh, to the spirit or intellectual fashion of a particular journal's ideological drift or a publisher's preference. So there are all these vagaries involved. Working for RSI stakeholders operates on a somewhat differentiated angle or pace. It is not one that becomes less objective as a mode of operation. The academic mission is qualified with policy needs in mind. The think tank mission of forward engagement is also, I quote, to ponder the improbable, unquote. In sketching out scenarios, raking over past and present events, and identifying patterns for future prediction. Editing this book has afforded me fresh insights into the work of those centres and programmes that work very closely with the various government ministries. These range from Home Affairs to MINDEF and to the environment. As the chapters by Kumar Ramakrishna, Shashi Jayakumar, Rohan Gunaratna, Jimmy Tan, Eddie Lim, and Daniel Trott put it, RSIS not only provides research papers to government bodies, it assists them with the clout to convene gatherings of experts from Singapore and abroad to share knowledge and trigger productive debates on a variety of issues. In these ways, RSIS can be said to serve as a knowledge conductor between the country, the Asian region, and the world. The issue of counterterrorism needs no further introduction, for instance. RSIS assists in the sharing and dissemination of the issues concerned with, quote, winning the hearts and minds, unquote, of populations menaced by the propaganda reach of fundamentalist terrorists, both online and offline. Even cybersecurity, and I strongly encourage you to read the chapter on Singapore's digital defences, is now fully on the radar of RSIS research and advocacy, as evidenced by this chapter I just referred to. Uh, I was also equally impressed by the tremendously steady quote, track two, unquote, diplomatic work carried out by Tan Si Singh, uh, my good colleague, uh, Kwa Chong Guan, and Mr. Tan Sing Chai, and I should say Ambassador Tan Sing Chai. This has been documented, uh, interestingly, and I think for a very rare occasion, in the first person by their respective contributions to the book. Building confidence and keeping the peace do not fall squarely on the shoulders of government ministries and specialized agencies. RSIS Academic diplomats are also making a vital, even if understated, contribution. Finally, RSIS uh, needs to be described as an information portal for taking the pulse on Asia-Pacific politics and international security. All this has been revealed by the chapter authored jointly by Yang Razali and Mushahid Ali on the institution of the RSIS commentary. Uh, even for those of us working within the school, I'm sure you've never known a lot of these little details about the, the 
what called the brick beds and the roses they get from publishing our commentaries. And more often than not, uh, they are at the receiving end of all these things, all right? And they will filter uh, some of the not so good things before they send them on to us. And sometimes they'll let through the unadulterated criticism as well. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the RSIS commentary uh, is actually an important anchor for RSIS position on the world map of influential think tanks. Love it or hate it, okay, uh, it is there and it offers a 24-7-365 forum okay, for various parties in the Asia Pacific to cross sorts uh, in terms of discourse words and so on. Uh, embassies and journalistic circles, even other think tanks, read it religiously because its contributors reflect on issues and the implications, particularly in the heat of the moment. Uh, I've even been told by an important person in the US Embassy in Japan that if they want to know what's the latest on any issue, they'll read RSI's commentary, not anything else. Right? And those of you who actively follow the South China Sea dispute, uh, I believe a book is coming up soon on the subject, and I'm plugging this for Young. Um, and it collects most of the commentaries that uh, have been published uh, by RSIS, and it gives you all, this, all the valuable views uh, from various parties and so on. Additionally, I draw your attention to Ralph Emerson's chapter on the South China Sea, in part because he's devoted a good part of his academic career doing research on the South China Sea dispute. And uh, additionally, Ambassador Desker's chapter offers a very rich perspective on what he calls the policy academic nexus uh, that has become central to RSI's becoming a source of expertise across Asia. Since I'm on the issue of information sharing and checking, I wish to take this opportunity to publicly thank Yang Razali and Mushahid Ali for their very deep commitment to helping me edit this book. So uh, in total, I would say that there were five pairs of eyes going through this text. So if there are any still uh, extant uh, editing errors, okay, I take full responsibility for them, but rest assured that five pairs of eyes went through the entire text. All right. Uh, and the last two editors uh, were actually Colin Cole, Dr. Colin Cole, and Rashni, Ms. Rashni Gamach of the Maritime Security Program. Okay, they were also important as a final line of editing. To conclude my remarks, I can only say that an RSIS mixed economy is truly in evidence. We are multinational, we are academics, and we actively partner our stakeholders, even engage them in some productive debate. I dare say we are also a veritable bazaar of expertise on security and international studies without waiting for any siren call to produce specializations. Thank you. Uh, Alan Chong is known to you as a postmodern uh, critical security studies student. However, if you actually know him and go to his office, you will know that his hobby is building technically accurate models of warships, uh, both historical and contemporary. Uh, Bilvia Singh is actually not paid by RSIS. He is a faculty member of uh, NUS. But because he finds the atmosphere more conducive at RSIS, he, 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 is a, <laughs> uh, he, he is here at, at his uh, RSIS office almost every day. I think one of the things I'm glad about is when he asked me for an office, I agreed to it, because I think we have been the beneficiary. Uh, and uh, Ang uh, Cheng Guan was present at the creation with Mr. S. R. Nadan. He was one of the first few together with the minister who helped to put IDSS together. Uh, Cheng Guan left us to join the history academic group at uh, NTU. But we were able to persuade him to come back to join us when he realized that there was space for historians at RSIS, that we weren't all interested only in strat studies or IR specialists. So I think the theme that uh, we are discussing today is how we have moved uh, from, being, uh, from having a unique role as a think tank uh, and a professional graduate school of international affairs. This dual role has been an opportunity, not a cons constraint. 
Because what it has allowed us to do, in, in my view, uh, is that it has given us the capacity to influence ongoing developments and future trends. And this is significant, not just from an academic or intellectual perspective, but also for Singapore. What it has done is made Singapore a center of ideas shaping regional and global perspectives. But I am not the speaker today. The commentators, uh, Bilvia Singh and Ang Cheng Guan, will take up issues which, are, uh, which have been raised uh, by Alan Chong. Could I give the floor to Bilvia Singh? This institution, though only 20 years old, has served with distinction uh, through sterling efforts of each and every one. And I think what we are doing today uh, is a tribute uh, to our monumental success. Our Chair, Ambassador Berry, and I owe him a debt of gratitude because he brought me to this institution. I still remember our meeting in uh, the Dome Cafe at Dempsey Road. <laughs> Minister, EDC, and Joe, colleagues, friends, excellencies. Now, a collective of 23 writers through 17 chapters plus a dedication, conclusion, introduction, and after what? Uh, edited by my good friend Alan Chong, uh, we used to be together in the PS department, I think has captured uh, 20 years, the essence of 20 years of the trials and tribulations of this institution, which has today emerged as one of the leading think tanks uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Now, commemorating 20 years of RSIS, this volume uh, captures to me the meaningful record of the journey of an institution which has emerged as a thought leader. I dare say there's none, none other in this country. There are bits and pieces, but if you bring together what we have, it is a thought leader in strategic and security studies, though within the ambit of international studies. While paying tribute to the pioneers and key players who gave birth to this institution, through various publications, commentaries, meetings, discussions, appearance on televisions, commentaries in uh, newspapers, and wherever you one can be, RSIS has definitely not only left an indelible mark on this nation, region, and the world, but I think what is often missed sometimes is that we have a depository of public intellectuals under one roof. And I think this is an amazing feat for a very small nation and working on a very tight budget still to be able to achieve that. I don't think a day passes more or less, without RSIS being mentioned in the national or regional media. Now this is because we are on the forefront of almost every major issue that afflicts the region, which has implication for Singapore, especially in the security and uh, safety arena, be it traditional security or non-traditional. Today's launch is to honor each and everyone who have partaked in RSIS development and growth with the book as a flagship to record what RSIS has achieved and what I think it aspires to do. Now, acts of commemoration are like building memorials to honor people, events, and particular achievements. Every culture come up with their own versions of honoring people and doing things. But we as a think tank, what better way have we found than to produce a volume you know, and to capture? It's like a child. We should be able to always refer back and say, hey, this is what we were, what we have done, what we hope to do, and hopefully 30 years from today, 40 and 50, we have a cross-reference of where we have actually arrived uh, through this journey. It's not, a diff not an easy journey, it's a difficult journey. By this act of commemoration, we have actually achieved three things. One, it may be the dimension not so clear, but I'm sure it's there. I've been here for a while, it's been, definitely it's here we've been able to cultivate an abiding sense of community. There is an RSIS community. The, the degree of collegiality in this institution is amazing. Believe you me, ask me. <laughs> ask me. 
what differentiates us from other institutions and think tank, uh, and what makes us what we are. We have an identity. Uh, I think we have to work hard, we have achieved hard, we have to work hard to keep it. Number two, instill a sense of significance of what we are, what we have done, and what we intend to do. All the talk uh, of Mr. Nathan of improbability is not empty noise. I think we have achieved many things. We are great achievers in those things we, which we put our mind to. And I think this is something to be very proud of. Thirdly, cherish lasting memories of our people. Eventually, institutions are not built by cement. It's built by people. And the achievements of these people, be they leaders, thinkers, and those people who actually make this institution tick on an almost daily basis. I'm sure you know, amidst us, there are many, many unsung heroes. Each and every one of them count. And I think this is what makes us so great. Some commemorations can be very painful, such as those that involve war, or disasters, as Minister Chan was involved in Flying Eagle, huh? the tsunami in 2004. But ours is a joyful celebration of manifold achievements we can put our names to, especially in the area of intellectual creativity. Even though we did not just talk, but we also did try to actualize what we are talking about. One which comes to my mind is the effort in May 2015 uh, through EDC to salvage the MILF Philippines government uh, peace agreement. Uh, I think we did something. Of course, we need to do a bit more. But so it's not just talk. Number two, I think what the RRG has been doing since uh, the discovery of the JI. Uh, these are actually amazing efforts of what we talk about a think tank. We are definitely much more than that. Looking back, we have sought to greater heights and even we hope to go to higher heights because we have been blessed by four strengths, lest we forget this. One, excellent leaders, including visionary political masters such as the late Mr. Lee Kuan Liu, Dr. Go Keng Sui, Mr. Esra Jaratnam, and top-notch CEOs such as the late S.R. Nathan and two who are amongst us, Ambassador Barry Desker and Ambassador Ong. I think they made the difference in pulling us together. We come from different directions, different thoughts, different schools, but there is a school called RSIS, even though I may come from SENS and somebody else may come from somewhere else. The net result has been we have become an intellectual supersonic jet. We are RSIS. We are part of RSIS. That's one factor. Number two, again, each and every one of us, all of us here, we have top class researchers, the so-called foot soldiers the thinkers who labor 24 hours a day to produce a work that makes a difference. I remember Joseph telling us, if you want to publish a commentary, make sure it makes a difference. Otherwise, don't publish. You're right, you. I agree with you. Wholeheartedly. Otherwise, don't waste your time. So, and we are good at that. So we have been working and making the difference, and because we have people who have the capacity to do that, and uh, we should keep getting people of this nature. What is often missed sometimes? I come from NUS, from the political science department. What is often missed is that we also have succeeded in developing Singaporean-based core researchers. This achievement is laudable and is important, all the more because we are working in an area which involves security, national security. And the more Singaporeans are involved, the more younger lot people are involved, the better we are. The third factor are the various synergies that we've been able to develop nationally and internationally, allowing us to leverage on all kinds of national and international talent, as you see in this room. At the end of the day, it is the sum total of who we are, what we are, and the ability of each leader in every school to pull us together to make what we are. And that's what RSIS is. It's Singaporean, based Singaporean, but it's more than that. So never forget that dimension. And I think RSIS is always very, very welcoming uh, of outsiders. Yet, we also have got a Singapore core at the base of it. The fourth factor, the various resource support 
without which I don't think we'll be able to achieve what we have. Uh, since Minister is here, my only hope is that more is poured in so that we can do more heavy lifting in the coming years. Because without resources, I think uh, we can, cannot go anywhere. Now, wherever Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is, Dr. Goh is, Mr. S. Rajaratnam is, and S. R. Nathan, they are. I'm sure they're looking down at us with a great degree of satisfaction. Because in many, many ways, we have actually fulfilled their dreams. We have actually arrived as an institution, a national institution, a regional institution, a global institution. Yet, I think one of the things uh, we should not forget is that we should not re uh, re rest on our laurels. We should endeavor for greater heights. Finally, what makes us unique and special, I think, is the integrity and trust factor with which we operate. We are here to serve the institution and the bigger nation. We get all kinds of resources, but we should not forget that dimension. Nothing must be done to undermine or subvert this in any way. We are about honor. We are about credibility. And we are about excellence. These are not cliches. We are a value-add institution of this nation and its people. We are symbolic of something that's very unique to Singapore. That has allowed us to punch above the weight. We are example, par excellence, of Singapore's brand of soft power, influencing national and regional ideas on security, on strategy. We must continue to enhance our strength through hard work, imagination, and integrity. Congratulations to all those who are present, all the authors, especially Ellen, the editor, the publisher, we should not forget, because people are not keen to publish books based on Singapore. So a World Scientific, well done. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something on a very important day in the history of RSIS. God bless. Thank you, Bolivia. Could I now give the floor to Am Cheng Wan? Uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh, Executive Deputy Chairman, Ambassador Ong King Yong, <coughs> Dean Professor Joseph Liao, distinguished guests, colleagues. First and foremost, I wish to commend and congratulate Professor Alan Chong for his editorial leadership in crafting this book, which is an excellent record of what RSIS has done in the last 20 years and continues to perform. As he has pointed out, this edited volume comprises both reflections for posterity as well as forward projections. This to me is indeed an appropriate and meaningful stance to take whenever we reach any milestone year. I believe this book will serve much more than just a record of the deeds, thoughts, projections, and aspirations of the RSIS fraternity. I think it will be essential reading years down the road for anyone who wishes to recall and understand the international politics, particularly of our region after the Cold War. IDSs, which, start, which started off as RSIS, which started off as IDSs, was established in 1996. One can describe the 1990s as still early days of the post-Cold War period. The region was still trying to grasp the full implications of the end of the Cold War, which had brought about the transformation in the security landscape. In those heady years of the 1990s, ASEAN was preoccupied with two major and concurrent projects, the enlargement of ASEAN and the formation of the ASEAN Regional Forum. It was therefore not surprising, therefore, that the first research project and the earliest publications of RSIS was on the future of the ARF and on preventive diplomacy and security co cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. The first major turning point of the post-Cold War period was the Asian financial crisis in 1997, which happened, which happened when IDSS was about one year old. Time does not permit me to go into what IDSs did in response to the crisis here except to mention one brought up in the book. The Asian financial crisis compelled the Southeast Asian governments to systematically and collectively focus their attention for the first time on what is now commonly labeled as non-traditional security issues. From 1998 to 2005, the Ford Foundation funded the research project on non-traditional security, NTS, in Asia. The objective was to advance the debate and understanding of non-traditional security issues in the region. RSIS is the leading driver 
of this study from 1999 to 2005, RSIS Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies remains the leader in this field today. Soon after RSIS entered the new millennium came the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, which led to the establishment of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research, which is another leader in the field of terrorism studies and research based in RSIS. Over the years since 2001, from Al-Qaeda to ISIS, and more broadly the focus on religious extremism, RSIS have expanded to include the Center of Excellence for National Security, and studies in the Interreligious Relations and Plural Societies program, each focusing on different aspects and dimensions of this very complex subject. As the book describes, RSIS has done research in many more topics and issues which reflect and address the challenges, trials, and tribulations of the post-Cold War period than what I have just briefly highlighted. These range from the challenges of ASEAN expansion to the South China Sea to defense diplomacy and the pillars and scaffoldings of the evolving security architecture. Last but not least, the book reminds us of the education role of RSIS. From its inception in 1996, one of the three functions of RSIS is to provide education and development programs for those civilians as well as the military who have an interest in security and strategic areas, specifically the four graduate programs as described by the first dean, Mr. Barry Desker, in his chapter, as well as a small PhD program producing cutting-edge research described by our EDC in his. Which is why both RSIS and this book open many windows to help us understand the interna international politics of the region. Alan's edited volume launched today will be a useful guide for the first 20 plus years of the region post-Cold War for a long time. Congratulations, Alan. Thank you. Today, is a memorable occasion. 20 years has since passed, and I must say that if you ask Mr. Naden or myself, or the first few staff from Chengguan to Joseph and Terence, these were the first few staff, minus the other two eminent staff, Daisy and Maniam, who was the PA to Mr. Naden and uh, the driver to Mr. Naden, we were the staff 001 to 004, if you like. If you've asked us 20 years ago, would we have imagined an IDSS or RSIS of today? Then any one of us who have told you that it will be so will be lying through our teeth. So today, what can I share with you? And I was always reminded that when Ken Yong invited me back here, I thought it was a rather dangerous proposition <laughs> for the following reasons because I'm no longer the minister in the Ministry of Defense. Uh, I no longer have any direct dealings with uh, IDSS, RSIS per se. So it's always dangerous to invite someone from the past to come back and share. Because you never know if this guy is coming here to give you any pronouncement of your future direction as some form of minister who is unrelated to the people who are sponsoring you. Or maybe this guy is just coming back as Chan Chun Seng who stopped to reminiscence about the past, and you wonder where this will lead you to. But having said that, I must share with you some of the birth pangs of IDSS, and perhaps as we look forward, we can also look at the real world mirror of where we have come from. In 1996, IDSS was started with funding essentially from MINDEF, perhaps a bit from MHA, a bit from MFA. If you have asked anybody in 1996 why we needed IDSS, I must say that it wasn't a clear-cut answer to say that, yes, we must have this institution called IDSS. In fact, if you understand the DNA of the Ministry of Defense, MFA and MHA, you will know that these agencies are run by a bunch of very hard-nosed people. Highly skeptical. And at that point in time, if you were to make a proposal to any of the minister to say that you needed money to start yet another think tank, you will need to justify very hard why you are you even contemplating. Why were you even contemplating that? To be frank, at that point in time, we had ISIS, 
who was already well established. We had IPS and we had one or two other think tanks. And at that point in time, whether is it then or now, think tanks were never in fashion. Think tanks who were, who were able only to give some academic ideas, opinions about issues, were never in vogue or in favour with people who have to run real organisations, operate real issues and so forth. So then why IDSS in 1996? Because if we forget that, then it will also affect where we are going as RSIS in the next 10, 20 and many more years. So I would say this. If we had wanted to start IDSS in 1996, it was for a few very clear reasons. Number one, we knew at that point in time that the world was becoming more complex. The agencies dealing with these issues, MINDEF, MFA, and to a lesser extent, MHA at that point in time, were all having to have their plates full to deal with the real issues, the real operational issues. So the first reason that we thought of setting up a separate institution, despite the lack of talent and resources, was that we wanted a group of people who can distance themselves slightly from the day-to-day -day operations in the ministries to think long term, to think differently. And that must still remain true. Yet at the very same time, we did not want IDSS nor RSIS to be a pure academic institution. Because if IDSS or RSIS has been a pure academic institution, then there will be no place for RSIS or IDSS because we have enough think tanks in Singapore and beyond. We wanted RSIS, IDSS to maintain a close nexus with the agencies and yet to, to understand the day-to-day -day challenges of operations, policies and so forth, domestically, foreign relations and so forth but yet at the same time have a bit of a space and distance to think long term. So today, if I'm harsh, I would say that I will check among the audience. How many of you are from MINDEF, MFA or MHA here? If you are no longer preserving that link, then we will be in a slight pickle because we want RSIS to stand up both in its academic rigor and, its, and, it, and in its policy practical orientation. It is not your fault and it is not your responsibility per se to maintain that link. It is something which I will put it to MINDEF, MFA, MHA and the government agencies including even MTI and other agencies that are at the forefront of international relations to make sure that they maintain that very link with RSIS. RSIS does not exist independently on its own for its own sake and I'll come back to this in a short while. So that was the first thing, to have some distance and yet some space to think about it and yet that connection. That's the second reason. The second reason was what some of you have mentioned before, and that is that we have envisaged IDSS and RSIS to be part of the what we call the Track 1.5 network. The Track 1 is of course the official network, and we know in the Asian context, the Track 1 has its utility, and yet it has its own limitations, which has been why we have always wanted a track 2. And somewhere between the track 1 and 2 is of course the track 1.5, which we hope IDSS and RSIS can be the conduit. And then I'll come back to this in a while to illustrate why the role of RSIS and IDSS has not changed. In fact, it has strengthened over all these years. 
And there is a third reason for us to want to establish an independent institute rather than to have the MINDEF, MHA, MFA people all congregating together. And that reason is to check the blind spots in our system. To check the blind spots in our system. The biggest challenge for any government agencies or every big organisation is that after a while, we talk amongst ourselves and we have group think. And maybe perhaps in response to one of your questions, uh, your remark is exactly this. How can RSIS continue to perform that role as the institution in Singapore that helps us check ourselves, our blind spots, in our policy making, in our approaches to bilateral and multilateral affairs, and so forth? So these were the three reasons why we convinced ag ourselves against our natural instincts to want a separate and independent institution despite the fact that we had limited talent at that point in time to have any independent institution at all. To make sure that we give ourselves space and distance and yet a connection to develop new thinking, new perspective. Which is why pondering the improbable. To make sure that we build the network, the track, the track 1.5 network. And the third but not the least, to make sure that we check our blind spots. Now, so going forward in the next 20 years or so, if I may take the liberty to pose this question to everyone present today, perhaps the most important question for us today as we celebrate the 20 years of achievement is this. If we are to challenge ourselves in one sentence, to define success for RSIS in 10, 20 years, what would that be? One sentence, not the usual one sentence with one whole paragraph, just one sentence. In less than 10 words, what would we be? Because if we don't answer this question clearly, then the danger is not that we don't have enough resources. The danger, paradoxically, is that we have too much resources and then our minds start to drift and our mission, you know, in the military terms, you call this mission drift. When you have too much resources, you start to wonder and do many other things which are all very good but not necessarily essential. What would be the definition of success for RSIS in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't have the answer, per se, and I'm not your paymaster, so please excuse me. You don't have to listen to my rambling. You just take it as one of the nostalgic midwife assistant coming back to share with you some ramblings. But really, what is... Anybody want to try? In one sentence, less than 10 words. What would be the definition of success for RSIS? That if today we, were, we are to write an email or to write a postcard as well, like it. I'm quite, I'm quite old-fashioned. If I give each and every one of you a postcard and you write it down in, less, in a sentence in less than 10 words and I post it back to you in 10 years' time to say that this was your definition of success for RSIS. In 10 years' time, when you look at it, would it correspond to what you have envisaged? Because today's world, today's environment is extremely challenging and we can be easily distracted by the many good things that we can do with the resources we have, with the talent that we have. But the real thing is, what would be that one thing that define our success as RSIS? I say ours because I feel that I've always been part of this journey. Would it be the number of books that you have published? Would it be the number of articles that you have written? the number of seminars that you have conducted, or would it be the number of references that people have made about RSIS? Yes, perhaps all these are enablers, but all these, while they may be useful indicators, will certainly not be your definition of success, if I may submit to you. If so, then what is your definition of success? 
And whenever I ask this question, I'm also keenly reminded by the conversation between the French leader and Zhou Enlai. That when asked what Zhou Enlai thought of the French Revolution, he replied that it's too early to tell. <laughs> and maybe the work of IDSS and RSIS has a bit of that element. That in 20 years, in a short 20 year span, perhaps it's a bit too early to tell. As many of you have spoken, it's still a work in progress. But put that all aside, what would be the, that definition of success? I would say, very simply, if we go back to where we started with, our definition of success for RSIS would be simply this. Would RSIS have helped to advance the interests of Singapore as an independent, sovereign and free country? Why I always start from this basis? I have never taken it for granted that countries like ours, small, will survive very long. I have never taken it for granted. I have read the Cambridge History of Southeast Asia, two volumes of them, over a thousand pages. Haven't found too many city-states in the history of Southeast Asia that have survived very long. And those who survive longer than the rest tend to have the following characteristics. They are able to read the winds and ride the waves. They have people who are keenly aware of what is happening around them. To be able to anticipate, to be able to take adjustment, to make adjustment, course correct as the boat sail or the plane flies. That is the only way that small city-states like us can survive a bit longer to defy the odds of history. And if we look at the history of Southeast Asia, the way the borders change, borders change, it is perhaps even more exciting than the equivalent period of the warring states in China. And people tend to forget that. If we look back in the last 50 years, which were the significant borders changes that you can recall? Today, very few people even remember that Aceh was independent and not exactly part of the current day Indonesia until 1949. And if we don't understand that, we can never understand why Gerakan Aceh Merdeka, or the Free Aceh Movement, came about, what it means for the Achenese and so forth. But it is true that the geopolitics of this region has been and will continue to be much more fluid than many other parts of the world. And for this reason, we can never take the survival and continued success of Singapore for granted. Which is why an institution like RSIS, you are, if you like, the canaries in the coal mine to help us identify the interests, individuals and institutions that can shape the course of history and geopolitics in this region. These regions are never very far from what I call the three I's and four R's. The three I's, the interests, individuals and institutions. Can RSIS continue to provide the country a good read of these three things? Way ahead of times, how this interplay and impact on our future and recommend actions for us as a country to take to not only survive, but to thrive. The interests of nation states, the interests of different groups, non-state groups, the individuals, not just the established individuals who come from the previous old order power structure, 
but new characteristic. Will we be caught up? Because as a small country, we fail to know the individuals that will impact on the course of history for this region. And to be frank, given the current fluid state in the geopolitical environment in this part of the world and many parts of the world, the old established order, if you like, has changed. And for those of us who fail to identify the new interests and new individuals, then we will not do very well to help our country. And finally, institutions. Institutions are constantly evolving. Will RSIS not only be able to understand and appreciate the current institutions, be able to shape the conversation and have the intellectual leadership to drive and develop new institutions for this region and beyond. I talk about the three I's and four R's. And you, the four R's, I've spoken about it in one of the previous sessions when I came back for summer school to share. Issues in this region are never too far away from the four R's. Race, religion, rights, resources. And if you look at it, in the next 10, 20 years, this will continue to be the same issues that will bedevil geopolitical relations. While many people hope that we will move towards a race-blind society, a race-blind world, actually, the current state of the world is that race, religion, the primordial forces are, becoming, are coming to the forefront in an era of uncertainty. And we always know that in an era of uncertainty, race, religion will always come to play. And in a fluid situation without clearly established institutions, like many other parts of the world, the issues of rights, sovereign rights, the contest over resources as society population grow will become more contested. So I ask interests, individuals, institutions, race, religion, resource, rights. These are never too far away from us. So if we say that the definition of success for RSIS as an institution is to help advance the cause of Singapore, to not only survive but to thrive, then can RSIS be the canary that help us to identify the new interests, individuals, institutions? Can RSIS help us to identify the new individuals that we have to understand, appreciate? Can RSIS help us to educate a new generation, not just Singaporeans, but people beyond Singapore, to understand the cause of Singapore so that we enlarge our circle of friends and narrow our circle of opponents. That the Singapore dream as an independent sovereign country with its, sets of, with its set of values, meritocracy and so forth will live on and be able to win the hearts of the people who come to us. We are one of the few countries in the world, one of the few nation states in the world that have very little history to talk about. That we cannot fall back on our history to bind us as one people, one country. But while we never and can never have a common history, race, language or religion, we can always inspire our people with a common future and a common set of values. Will RSIS be able to play this role for Singapore in educating our people on the geopolitical and security challenges here and beyond, also to share with our friends and friends-to-be of what we stand for and why perhaps they should give us a chance to support our continued existence in this part of the world. So ladies and gentlemen, I probably have overstayed my <laughs> welcome by challenging you to think about some of these issues that I've shared with you. I must admit that I don't have the answers. I didn't have the answers 20 years ago. I don't have all the answers now, 20 years later. But I hope that together with your help, you will help us find some of these answers, act on these answers, that you, as an established institution now, never having, nev never ever thinking that you have arrived, but always thinking that you are a work in progress to help us to advance the cause of Singapore, to help us understand those interests, individuals and institutions 
that will impact on our future to help us understand the forces that we have to contend with and to navigate. Because if you have done that and you can do that well, then you would have contributed in your very important ways to the continued survival and success of Singapore. And if I may just round out this by taking a note from what I think Joseph would have challenged all of you. Everything that we write and everything that we do must have an impact. Otherwise, let's not waste time. And if we can do this and do justice to the resources given to us, then our forefathers who have conceived IDSS and RSIS would be able to be very proud of what we have achieved here. That we are an institution that distinguishes ourselves not just because of our academic rigor, but because of our ability to marry the academic rigor with the operational executive issues that has to be managed at hand. So on that note, I wish you all the very best in your onward journey, and I hope to be able to come back and join you in this journey as often as I can, and I hope that you will continue to contribute to the continued success of our country, Singapore. Thank you very much.